The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. What do you think the word of the Lord was this morning? Basically, breaking chains? Very clear. I love it because, like I said, what we have now, even with spontaneous worship and, and participation, participation, not spectation, spectation, um, I believe that what God is, is, is doing is He's done it. He did it in my very first pastorate. When I was a young pastor, I had that youth pastor that basically would come in and give a prophetic word and he would literally zero in on the title of my message. And I always found that just wonderful how God has a particular topic on his heart and it can be corroborated. And so I believe that what God's message is for today is basically uh, been corroborated and it's going to be understanding what it is to be Fully awake. Say that back to me. Fully awake. To be fully awake, you're fully alive. All right? So let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we just ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would bring this to our attention and that you would cause um, an awareness to fully incite us to action, to awake our spirit, to awake, awake, O sleeper. If there's any part of our nature that is still sleeping and slumbering, we're calling forth for an awakening. We want to be on the forefront of what God is doing in the church universal. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Get rid of the barriers, the leg irons, any hindrances whatsoever. Here's a word that was given to us in a major conference in New England once. And it was basically, I think it was Barbara Wentribble, uh, literally single Jennifer and I out and pointed to us and she says, those who discover the presence within stand at the gateway of powerful Christian living. Those that discover the presence within. Now you're all born again, but you almost have to, disc- there's some uncharted territory in there that is kind of sleepy. All right? It's kind of, kind of like the seven dwarfs. We, we got all of them in there and we got to get them out so that we can be fully awake. Those who discover the presence within stand at the gateway of powerful Christian living. It's learning to live from the heart. It's learning to practice the presence of God. And so basically the word that I believe is coming is that prayer is life itself, but for, for I believe the future of the church, that much of what we're teaching is gonna become normative much of it's going to replace uh, getting ministry, per se, and really learning how to abide. We know it's in the scripture, but we don't talk much about it, or the concept seems too fuzzy. But practicing the presence 24-7 is a reality. I know it experientially, and I know that it's going to take off. And basically, even what they call Christian counseling is going to fade away, and people are going to begin to enjoy really a deeper, fuller, abiding relationship or a practicing of His presence. Scriptures that have been relegated for the future because they don't seem realistic are going to be brought to the forefront and they're going to be practiced by many. That's going to be... I mean, there's so many scriptures that I've fallen in love with over the years that you don't hear preached mainly because even the preacher doesn't walk in it. Like, consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. When's the last time you heard a message on it? Well, you heard it here because I did it last week. But anyway, uh, (laughs) consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials that the testing of your faith produces. There's an attitude there of victory that it's like, wow, wonder what something good's coming now because everything's falling apart all around me, but it can't harm me. In this world you have tribulation, but Jesus said, be of good cheer. He always brings joy into there. One of my favorite scriptures even that is going to come to the forefront is that 
Be steadfast, New American Standard, Colossians 1.11, be steadfast and patience with joy. You can't fake that till you make it, can you? Steadfast and patient with joy. Steadfast means no matter what circumstances are happening, life could be crumbling all around you. Patient has to do with people. Isn't that all of life? Circumstances and people. With joy. That's going to take a supernatural walk with God. You're not going to be able to just confess that into reality. You're going to have to have internal substance or transformation. And you're going to have to shake off some, some baggage in the process. So uh, I just believe that, that prayer for me is life itself. But prayer is not talking. It includes talking. But basically it's being fully awake, fully active, and fully aware. Now we've been covering that awareness thing. Uh, for some time. And, and you know, when the Lord lays something on my heart and He has me repeat it over and over again, I am not senile. I am doing that on purpose because I feel like it hasn't sunk in yet. Some things need to be said seven times before you go, oh. Well, here's the one that He's been uh, uh, laying on my heart for a long time. In 1 Corinthians 2, 15, it talks about the spiritual man discerns all things. But prior to that, it says the soulish man doesn't understand. It's foolishness. So you can be a believer and still be soulish and not understand the things of the Spirit. And if you don't understand the things of the Spirit, you're not aware of the Spirit. If you're not aware of the Spirit, wow, you're just going through the motions. God basically says, awake, awake, you sleeper. Come out of that slumber. There's a slumbering spirit even in spirit-filled believers. And it's, awakening is going to fix a lot of that. Because God's basically saying, here's the three things, and I've given this in two sermons already, and I'm going to give it in the third sermon. There's three elements, aware, understand, and then act. You have to be aware before you can understand. If you're not aware that the spirit realm exists, you're not going to understand enough to know what kind of a decision to make. The soulish man doesn't understand the things of the spirit, therefore his decisions are pretty, pretty, pretty iffy, aren't they? They're being led by the flesh. But if you are aware of the spirit realm, and right now in this room there's Holy Spirit, evil spirit, and, and human spirits, and they're interacting whether you're aware of it or not. But to be aware of it brings life into an adventure. It brings life into a place of meaning. And God's basically saying you have to be aware of that spirit realm. That's why we're calling forth for an awakening. And to release the shackles of the flesh. You've literally got to wean that wild man, that flesh, that soulish man. You've got to wean it from its rule so that the Spirit of God rises up with greater sensitivity and authority in your life. We're going to move the church universal from the place of Jesus being your Savior to Jesus being Lord. Adonai. Savior is something He did for you. Lordship is something you do to cooperate with Him. There's a difference, isn't there? He's your Savior. He did that for you. But Lordship is something that requires obedience on your part to submit to. Lord and Master. To me, out of all the names of God, Adonai is, is my favorite because everything we're teaching about the peace of God ruling is teaching the Lordship of Jesus. I understand the Spirit, and I'm not saying that in a bragging way, but from the time I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I knew that I knew that an awareness of His Spirit was a constant for me. For me, it was prayer, it was being with a person, not just saying stuff. And when I said stuff, I knew that I was coming from the proper source when I said stuff. And if I said something wrong, I knew it was the wrong source down here. I liked the, the children during the harvest the way they understood it, and you could feel the anointing coming from them, and I'm talking ages 6 to 12. There was what, how many? 70, eventually? 80? 70 to 80. 70 to 80 kids, and I'll tell you what, I didn't find one that couldn't do it. And here's what I told them to do. Adults, listen up. There was not one child that couldn't do this, so when adults tell me, I don't know, or like, like shit, I can't feel. Don't say that to me, because there's no such thing. <laughs> All right. Jennifer says, when a man says he can't feel, it means he's saying, I don't have any good ones. Right? We've seen you on the road, and we know you have feelings. <laughs> and push comes to shove, we'll step on your toe and go, there, did you feel that? 
I mean, really, don't get silly, all right? But um, these children, here's the way they got into the presence of God with no effort whatsoever, and you could feel the anointing come from them. I said, close your eyes. And, oh, first, you taught them this is your Bible heart. This is the Bible heart, not this. This is your Bible heart. This is where the will, this is where the door of the heart is. I said, close your eyes and open your heart to Jesus, and the anointing would increase instantly. And I'm talking 80 out of 80. Even the little hyperactive ones, if I could get them to close their eyes, the presence of God would come. Don't you think adults ought to be able to get that by now? Close your eyes and open the door of your heart, but not, the door, not this heart. Open the door. This is where Jesus came in. You open. You yield. You surrender. Actually, the five functions of the human spirit flow from here. If, if adults could master those five functions, they'd be walking in the spirit all the time. When you receive, you receive from here. This is where you got saved. You didn't get saved up here. You got saved here, and it impacted the mind, the will, and the emotions. It got into what they call the limbic loop. It got into to where all of a sudden Jesus was influencing the way you thought, the way you felt, and the way you acted. That's the lordship, right? So you receive down here. You release things from down here. How many people have gotten frustrated at work and somebody says, let it go? They're trying to let it go from here. They go, I can't let it go because that person told me I, I, I did it wrong and I didn't do it right. Blah, 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 blah. These are Christians. <laughs> let it go. Well, they're trying to let it go from here. It doesn't work. But if you would drop down to Jesus and let it go, peace would replace it. The supernatural peace of God, which means he's Lord. He's not just your Savior. When you have peace in your heart in difficult circumstances or with difficult people, Jesus is Lord. We're teaching the Lordship of Jesus. Don't you think it's, we need to get beyond him being our Savior and then just doing whatever we want? Why not walk in the Lordship and practice the presence of God? What was the other one? I'm just going to do all five. I wasn't going to do these this morning. but Oh, yeah, the favorite things the kids said. I said, what did you learn in this class? And they went, don't, it, don't close the door to Jesus. <laughs> you think we all could take a lesson from the children? Drop down, open, bring God into situations that are precarious instead of you trying to lay awake all night figuring them out. You'll come up with ridiculous conclusions with the reasoning mind, but if you open your door to the heart, the wisdom that's from above is first of all pure. It's going to be pure. It's going to be a clean answer, and it's going to be peaceful, and it's going to be full of mercy and good fruits. Right? They loved it. They just bake it, yield it. Uh, I receive down here. I release things from down here. I forgive from down here. I have loving intercession flow out of me from down here. And I'm saying, now, when we had the children pray for the other children, and this is something adults don't even do. I said, before you lay hands and say words, which the church is good at saying words, right? You could pray all day over some people. I said, first drop down and open the door of your heart to God. He's the source you want his nature on those words. Some people are so good with the right answers, but it's not connected to Jesus at all. They're giving it from the memorization, from their head. But the children to drop down, open the door of your heart, now pray for somebody. And then they would lay hands. Then the words had the proper source. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Not just the mouth speaks. And it's, if it's scripture, it's good. No, no, no. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth. Satan can quote scripture. So, I mean, it's like the source, the source, the source. If we're going to have an awakening, the thing I want more than anything is I want people to walk in supernatural discernment to where they recognize the source. Because much of what Christians are calling discernment are just the people in situations that irritate them. And they go, I discern, they've got a problem. When in reality, the problem is your response. I say, even intercessors, oh, come on. Intercess if you don't pay attention to source, it's like, all right, just, they've got unforgiveness toward their husband or their wife down here. And they're going, in the name of Jesus, I break that spirit of this, and I break that spirit of this. And I'm going, so with their lips, they're, they're supposedly binding the devil, and from their heart of unforgiveness, they're loosing the devil. Intercession has to be a flow of love. 
And I'm telling you what, there's going to be a generation of children that are going to grow up and they're not going to have to be re-educated like that. They're going to know that everything, the source, the source, the source. The source, if it's proper discernment, is to discern the motive or the source. Man looks at the outward appearance of body language and says he's discerning. I could do that without being saved. I could look at people's behavior and go, oh, bro, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fault finder. That's not even a gift. That's easy. But it's non-redemptive. God's basically saying it's life itself. God really wants you to uh, be aware before you can understand. If you're not aware of the spirit realm, then we need to call forth an awakening of new sensitivity to your human spirit, don't we? Your human spirit needs to be aware. God said, I put an anointing in you, and no one should have to teach you this because the Holy Spirit in you is more than willing to teach you, but you're stuck in your head. I've even had people, and it's just kind of embarrassing, hope probably a few in this room, but I don't know. Uh, people on Ustream, they need this. All right. I'll get emails on that. But anyway, people would say, I, I know you're talking about the spirit within, and I know you're talking about emotions, but I'm a head person. Well, don't be proud of it. <laughs> the soulish man doesn't understand. The head person doesn't understand. I couldn't believe how many people are proud of it. Well, I know. Well, I've always been a thinker. I, I'm not, are you proud of your IQ? Is that it? Because I'm talking SQ, spiritual quotient. What's your spiritual quotient? Because I'll never forget, I was, a, I was a brand new pastor many years ago, and God took that black screen, that x-ray screen, over a group of people, and they appeared white people, like bones, and, and they were big, big heads, and little atrophied spirits. And God said, minister to that spirit. That's what they need, spiritual maturity. And, and then you don't want to talk about emotions in church. Well, guess what? Your spiritual maturity is limited by your emotions. You, can, you can't be more spiritually mature than your emotions allow you. If you're an emotional basket case, you are not spiritually mature. I don't care how old you are, right? It's character is what God's talking about, spiritual maturity, not Bible knowledge. But the kind of life that God is talking about, aware before you can understand, and when you understand the spirit realm better, then you can act. Now, how many know binding and loosing? All right? You know, if you bind and you loose, right? That's what it says in uh, Matthew 18. And I see that in intercessor means. They're binding this and they're loosing this and they're binding this. But actually what it means is permit and forbid. Permit and forbid. It's that easy. And basically, what we, when we taught the kids is that I permit Jesus. I never close the door to Jesus. Uh, if I need uh, healing in my physical body, I open the door of my heart to Jesus and welcome the healer who lives in me. I'm not relying on somebody else to have to pray for me. I am yielding to, to Jesus in me, Christ in me, the hope of God. And I'm opening the door to Jesus. You know what they say? And it's not good to close the door to Jesus. You know what adults do? They get, come up for healing. You go to pray for healing. They op if they do open up to healing, I don't feel like I got it. They closed the door. And even the children said, it's not good to close the door to Jesus. <laughs> you think there's some wisdom in these, out of these mouths of babes? Don't. So what would happen then if I was sick in my physical body? And Jennifer, we wrote a book on this called Releasing the Divine Healer. But basically what we do is we open in the morning, whether we're sick or not, we welcome the healer to rise with healing in his wings and go to our entire body, go to every system, every organ. Every cell has gates and channels on it, like little doors on the cell. Open the gates and let the King of Glory and Jesus the healer come in. We did that for a few minutes in the morning. I'll tell you what, we're in better health in our 60s than we were in our 40s. We just welcome the healer. We prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. The soul needs to be ruled by his lordship, opening the door of the heart. But how do, if, if, if you're all bogged down with your thoughts, you know, so from now on, if anybody asks you, 
if you're spiritual, don't say, no, I'm, I'm a thinker. All right? That's actually pride. Everything rooted in pride is rooted in Satan. Everything rooted in humility is rooted in God. So go for the humble approach there. I need to get closer to Jesus. I need to be more spiritual. I need to open my heart. And then when I pray and when I speak, I need to make sure that before I speak and before I pray, I, I drop down to my spirit and I open the door of my heart to him so that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I had someone tell me this week, oh, I just took a course on, and I know that life and death are in the power of the tongue, right? And they are. And they said, if I just say it over and over and over again, I'm going to get better. i got to quit talking negative. I'll just say, I'll say, that might work. But the most brilliant psychiatrist that ever lived basically said, it's hard for the thoughts to get the emotions under control. And that's because they're starting at the wrong end. You might make some progress confessing something over and over and over again, but I would rather go to the source and deal with it instantly. You can take a covered wagon to California. I'd rather take a plane. <laughs> there's things that got to change. Seriously, there's things that got to change. If you want to be part of an awakening, then you've got to wake up and be as alive as you possibly can now. Because when that spirit outpouring comes, that's going to be glorious for everybody, but it's also going to be an accentuation of the things that you, that you are able to do, bring it to a whole nother level. Let's do all that you can at this point. All right? So, <clears throat> what's it mean to be fully awake? You have the equipment, but you've got to discover the presence within to come out of a sleep. And here's, here's just a few points that I... I, I like to think about. Um, you don't know that you're asleep until you wake up. How many have had an experience in God that you didn't know you were kind of dull until he woke you up? And all of a sudden you, you had this epiphany, right? You just had one recently. I have feelings. Oh, my goodness. I live my whole life suppressing, stuffing them, thinking they're just getting in the way and they're spoiling my life. And now I realize I need them that all that time I was suppressing them, I was doing myself more harm than good. They belong to God. You have no right to suppress emotions. Did you know that? You were bought with a price. You're not your own. It belongs to God. Your emotions belong to God. He wants your mind. He wants your will. He wants your emotions. And if he doesn't get all three, there's no transformation. He doesn't want two out of three. So you don't know that you're asleep until you wake up. That's point one for the note takers. I'm going to give you five points, and I swear I'm going to give you all five. Point one, you don't know that you're asleep until you wake up. Point two, and I believe this is where we are at in the church universal. In the dreaming times, you do things that you would never do when you are awake. Oh, is that true? Anybody have some dreams lately? You wouldn't do those things when you were awake, would you? If we're not fully awakened, we're like in a dream state. We're going through the motions. We're doing things that we shouldn't do. If we were truly awake in the spirit, there's a whole lot of things we wouldn't be doing. Do you think? When you are asleep, you hate the sound of an alarm. Right? That's why they have snooze buttons, apparently. They're, they're contributing to your baser nature. You know, not now, not now. So what would it take for some people? A rude awakening, a nice loud alarm clock to get your attention. A rude awakening is often necessary. But the point is, remember, it's the one who loves you. Point four was a rude awakening, in case you're still taking it. Point three, when you're asleep, you hate the sound of an alarm. A rude awakening is often necessary. And five, this is the most important one, the one who loves you is the one who's trying to wake you up. He's not trying to be 
make you uncomfortable. He's trying to get you to wake up. And when the Lord told me that he was taking me to the school of the Spirit, he took me to Isaiah 50, where he says, Dennis, morning by morning, I'm going to awaken your ear to hear. And he wasn't just talking about getting me out of bed. He was talking about an awakening to my perception of his nature and his voice. And that's what I believe he wants to do. I believe he wants to release the, 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 the drug type thinking and that dream like state and free us from that today. I believe that's probably what uh, the Lord was referring to in many of the words that were given this morning. I think it's basically free us from the shackles of the soulish life. And that even when God said, Dennis, I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit, and I'm going to awaken your ear to hear, one of the first things in that process was, he said, like, he gave me a psalm from uh, David. Uh, I believe it was Psalm uh, Nineteen. Oh no. Uh, anyway, he basically said uh, Psalm one thirty-two, maybe, like a weaned child with its mother. I have quieted my soul within me. What he was saying that if I'm going to awaken your ear and you're going to start hearing the voice of God more readily and more easily, the noisy thought life, your runaway emotions and your impulsiveness. Mind, will, and emotions. Your impulsiveness, your runaway thinking, your overthinking, and your emotional state is going to have to be quieted. In other words, I, don't always rely on me to be loud. Rely on yourself to quiet your soulish nature, and the voice will increase. Amen. Sensitivity increases as you decrease. You decrease, he increases. So basically, he taught me, who was a hyperactive child, Dennis the Menace, <laughs> he taught me to sit still, and I didn't like it at first. I wanted to get up and pray and walk. Anybody like that in this room? I wanted to go and check and see if I had oil for an oil change in the garage. I wanted to be active. And God said, that is the very thing that is getting in the way that you have to wean yourself from all that activity. And so I would sit, and here's the funny thing. After I would sit there for a while, even beyond what I felt my flesh enjoyed, suddenly there was a break. And all of a sudden, time, just it just transcended time. And I didn't realize that I was there that long. That is the kind of awakening that your soul needs so that spirit takes the ascendancy. But that's something that's perceivable, something you can endeavor to do on your own. You can sit in his presence until the antsiness is gone. If the antsiness is gone, you really didn't have much of a prayer life. And what God said, when you close your eyes, Dennis, and I know you're antsy, and I know you're hyperactive, and I know you'd like to get up and pace, and I know you'd like to change positions 20 times. I know you want to go get another coffee. I know you want to go look in the garage and see if there's enough oil for an oil change. I know you want to do all these things. But if you would resist that soulish temptation, you're going to honor me. And you honor me with any effort. But oh, how you ravish my heart when you do it right. Hmm? He doesn't love me any less, but you can ravish his heart when you can still that noisy flesh. Like a weaned child with its mother, I've quieted my soul within me. And I believe that was the, the time when God began to really awaken my spirit to be more sensitive. Yes, there was gifting when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, a gifting for discerning of spirits. But it took to practice his presence on a daily basis I had to recognize that my flesh got in the way too often. And the way he did it was, he didn't say, Dennis, I'm giving you emotional healing. He basically, if I would get upset in that prayer time, he basically would say, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. Is that, that yucky feeling really worth coming between me and you? And it was, the, it was the magnetic pull of a desire for a relationship that said, it's really not that important, let it go. Let it go, it's really not that important. 
we make things more important than they really deserve to be, but nothing is more important than that relationship. Now, basically, one of the uh, 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 words that the Lord is giving as far as awake is found in Deuteronomy 32.11. As an eagle stirs up its nest and it hovers over its young, spreading out its wings and taking them up, carrying them on eagle's wings. Basically, if you could picture these little eaglets in the nest and this mother eagle hovering over that, she is basically giving them an incitement or an excitement or to arouse or awaken their potential within. So we talked about this last week as fathering. Fathering is unpacking the potential. This mother eagle is spreading out her wings saying, this is your potential. I know you don't even have any feathers yet, but this is your potential. And I'm showing you what your potential is. And I'm, I want to awaken and incite that which is in you to come to the forefront. That's really what fathering is going to do in the days ahead. And as a matter of fact, we talked about reparenting last week, but the spiritual fathering series uh, that we have back there is, is a good one if you wanted to amplify the concept because I think we need it. I think we need spiritual fathering in the church. I think we have too, many, uh, too much of an orphan spirit. People who have never been able to uh, recognize a spiritual father when they saw one because they were too busy being independent, thinking that they're going to miss something. It's never changed. In 40 years of ministry, I've watched the ones that could have emerged as real quality leaders, but they were running all over the place like a tumbleweed. They never got roots because they're afraid they're going to miss out on something by getting roots. And what God's basically saying is this awakening to your potential is basically stirring up what's on the inside, speaking to your potential. And even like an instrument, like Abby plays the keyboard, she actually, the keyboard in and of itself doesn't do anything, it's just an instrument. But God's instrument at the keyboard awakens it to bring forth a beauty, and that's true of all instruments. And God wants you to be an instrument. He wants to awaken you to function the way He created you to function. Just sitting in a chair does not awaken your potential. There's going to have to be some, some times to where you get past your flesh and, and step forward. God's in the mood. Mood is not an emotion. Mood is a period of uh, long-standing attitude. Right? An emotion you can have for a few moments and it can come and go. But a mood goes for a long time. And I believe God is in, the mood of God right now is an awakening. There's an awakening on the forefront. Many believe it's already started. Whatever your concept is, the point is, what about you? The, to what degree are you becoming more spiritually sensitive? Or is it the same as it was two years ago, three years ago, four years ago? But God's looking to awaken that potential he wants to awaken you as an instrument, but you need an ear that is awakened to hear. Morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear. I can remember when he was first teaching me this, that I'm a heavy sleeper and I need my eight hours. Pure and simple, my whole life, I always did that. God would wake me in the middle of the night and I would put one foot out of the bed and let gravity pull me out because I didn't have the energy to get out of bed. But I would feel like just a feather would just brush across my spirit and I would recognize it as God wanting to commune. And I would put that leg up, fall out of bed, and just lay there in a semi-drugged. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, Jesus. And the, the joy and the 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 beauty of a, that divine romance was like it went without words. And then I can remember shortly after that, I felt that little light brush of the feather, and I just couldn't. I just stayed in bed and fell asleep. And then it was months and maybe even as much as a year before I ever felt that again. And it just grieved me that my insensitivity of heart could put distance between me and him. That 
sensitivity required an awakening. It required, it required a sensitivity that he wasn't going to get louder. I was going to have to get quieter or more still. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I wanted that spiritual strength of sensitivity back. And it was a long time before I got it back. And I thought, you know what? I don't think God was trying to punish me. I think God was trying to say, I've got something available for you. How bad do you want it? And he made me wait. I didn't like that waiting, but he made me wait. And I'll tell you what, it was the best lesson that I ever had. Jeremiah 1, 18, 8, verse 8 to 12. Jeremiah said this, I mean, the Lord said this to Jeremiah, Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And the Lord put forth his hand, and he touched his mouth. And the Lord said, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I've set before you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. And that's a separate teaching in and of itself when the Lord taught me, this is how the Word works. The Word in you, first of all, does not just get planted because you heard it one time. The Word is basically needs to be received into the soil of your heart. And basically what it does then is it says to root out. That word, if it's going to be planted in the soil of the heart, needs to root out evil. You need to repent from the evil. That word should be discerning you and convicting you and showing you what's in there. It needs to be rooted out. It's like the soil of the heart to produce good soil. Then it would go to root out and pull down. One is pertaining to soil. The other one is pertaining to a building. He's saying there's strongholds in your thinking that got to come down. And the Word is able to pull them down. And not only is it able to pull them down, but it goes on to say, and the soil of your heart, I want to destroy the soil of your heart for anything other than God. So not only do I want to pluck the evil out, I want to put weed and feed in there so that the only thing that grows is good stuff. So that destroy is a good kind of destroying, isn't it? I'm destroying it for anything other than me. And Jesus is the Word. Then He says, I'm going to throw down. Now we're back to building again. I'm going to throw down what strongholds, mental strongholds I tore down, I'm going to flatten them and I'm going to build something beautiful on top of that. Just like the way they conquered cities in the Old Testament. They conquered a city, they would lay it flat and build something new right on top of that. They'd use that old garbage as a foundation. God would basically say, I can take your mistakes and build something beautiful right on top of it if you give it to me and let me, let me throw it down. Then I can build, then I can plant. You know what he showed me? He showed me that it's not just easy of quoting the word and saying the word over and over and over again and somehow it's all going to work. He showed me this is the way the word works. I'm going to put the words in a prophet's mouth, but that word is going to be able to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, then build and plant. I want to cultivate the heart before that seed really takes root in your life and it becomes substance and you own it. I'm going to awaken your ear to hear. Jeremiah 1 also says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, what do you see? And he said, I see an almond tree. How many have read that before? I see an almond tree. That's actually a play on words. It's a waking tree. He said, I see a waking tree. You see well, Jeremiah, I'm about to awaken my word to perform it. I'm going to incite it, bring it to action, and bring it to pass. <clears throat> I'm causing that living word to rise up and accomplish my purposes. In the book of Haggai, this is a thus saith the Lord for the people of God for today. In light of an awakening. In Haggai, <clears throat> and he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, because I know that I know this is the word of the Lord. There were three awakenings in Haggai. Haggai 1, verses 4 to 6. <clears throat> is this time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while my temple is in ruin? 
Now therefore, says the Lord, consider your ways. For you have sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you do not are filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages, puts them in a bag with holes in it. You know what he's basically saying? The first awakening is going to require repentance. Repentance of your ways. Consider your ways. Repent, because what you're seeing is you're not seeing the kind of fruit in your life that you need to be seeing. Why? Because my temple. Now, in this case, it was a physical temple. Now, it's this temple. My temple's in ruins. You're letting the soul run this thing, and you're just doing what your soul wants to do, your flesh. You're a saved, spirit-filled Christian living primarily with what you want to do, when you want to do it, and how you want to do it. And he says, while my temple here is lying in ruins, repent and recognize the magnificent potential this temple has if it was fully awake. If it was fully awake and fully alive, it would be, it would be un, unbelievable the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. Unbelievable, extravagant. So the first awakening in Haggai was, consider your ways. You've sown much and you bring in little. Repent. So the first awakening then is basically saying, I think I've been asleep somewhat, and I definitely need a personal awakening of my spirit to come into real life with a capital L. The second awakening, Haggai 1, verse 14. So the Lord stirred up or awakened the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, and the spirit and the remnant of the people, and they all came and worked on the house of the Lord. How many have noticed that in even times of renewal and refreshings and revivals, whatever they want to call it, because they changed the name based on, on, on performance, but how many noticed that all of a sudden there was a deeper interest in coming together into people's, how many remember even Brownsville? All of a sudden people were giving up activities. I've got news for you. It's almost going to be like during an awakening, you're going to be judging things by a totally different way. You're going to be more like an owner or a steward than a, an employee. I've said it for years. How many are in business for themselves? Anybody in this room? Okay. You have a totally different mentality than an employee. An employee punches the clock and then almost to an idolatrous point is their free time. Come on, isn't that true? You can't wait to leave work so that you can do what you want to do. That's an employee. An owner says, I'll do whatever it takes. I don't have set hours. I don't have the luxury of nine to five. I've got to do whatever it is because I'm where the buck stops. How many are aware of that? It's a totally different attitude. But if that were to infiltrate the church properly, you would recognize you are a steward of the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you're not your own. You are bought with a price. That you don't have the luxury of, of always having all of this recreational time and my time and everything. I'm saying that there's scattered charms in the church. Jeremiah called them scattered charms. You know what they are? Without knowing it, they're not backslidden. But I love Jesus. I love my free time. I love my car. I love my boat. I love my family. I love, but they have them all on an equal line. It is not the lordship of Jesus and all these other things are being added to you. They're being placed equally and they don't know they're backslidden because they're asleep. That's where you awake, awake, you who sleep, because you've got your priorities on an even keel. Oh, Jesus is in there. That's why you don't recognize. But if God says, if I taught you that you were an owner, that you were a, 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 a steward of this temple, you'd start working on it, just like they did in Haggai. And the Spirit of God is going to hover over people, and they're going to start working on this temple, because you're an owner. You are responsible. And you gave it to God, and you were bought with a price. You're not your own. He's supposed to be Lord, not just your Savior. And so that awakening is going to be to work. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, 
and they awakened the spirit of Zerubbabel, and all who came worked on the house of the Lord. Haggai 2.4 says, Now be strong, Zerubbabel, be strong. By the way, God gives the same answer in all aspects. Fear not, I am with you. Every Bible character who ever tried to give an argument to God, he gave the same answer. So it's got to be good for you and I. Uh, I can't, Moses, I can't speak. Oh, Jeremiah, I'm too young. I am with you. In every case, he would tell those leaders, I am with you. What's your problem? The point is, you're not aware that I'm with you. When we told those children to, okay, close your eyes and drop down and open the door of your heart to Jesus, they said, how do you feel? It feels good. I feel peace. I feel good. I feel peace. I feel love. I feel like he's right here with me. If they can do it, why can't you do it? Oh, because I'm a thinker. Don't do that. I, that let's, next time you're tended to say, I'm a thinker, and you're, it tells you you have a great mind, next time say, I'm a soulish, carnal Christian. <laughs> that might get that out of your system. I don't feel the presence of God. I don't sense the Holy Spirit. I'm carnal. I'm, I have a great sharp mind. Okay. What feeling do you have? I'm stressed. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, you're stressed. Yeah, mm hmm. Stress means you're being emotionally controlled by people and circumstances. Isn't that nice? For all you men that don't have emotions. Oh, I don't get into the feminine side. I don't have emotions. No, what you mean is you don't have any good ones. Women have the 64 Crayola box of emotions. They've got flavors and nuance that you never heard of. They've got, I mean, it's like a science. I think the most amazing thing a man could do is study women. You could, you could learn so much. I mean, I learned from Jennifer. I had to re-educate, not educate, re-educate. When Jennifer would tell me no, she would go like this. No. That looked like a yes to me, but I found out, eh, just because the head's going like this, she goes, ah. Oh. I have to go with the nature that's attached to that head going like this. Men, if you say, can I go play, can I go play basketball with the guys? And they go, go. Don't go. Anybody, anybody with me on this? It's a science. Go ahead. That is a definite no. So, what's the first awakening? We're going to do this. Repent. The second awakening is to work on this temple and quit just sliding by. We call it intentional sanctification. Do you know how we did this? We did this. Basically, it transformed Jennifer's life and many people since then. Hundreds of people have testified around the world to the 60-day challenge. The 60-day challenge is for the purpose of in, in intentional sanctification. You know what that means? Don't wait till you're bummed out and go, oh God, what's wrong? Everything's falling apart. It's like when you're feeling good and you're worshiping and you're in union and communion. Say, God, search me for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Search me, oh God, for secret faults. What's a secret fault? It means I don't know but I don't want to commit big blunders later on. Search me and remove, eradicate those things. Search me for secret faults. That's a man after God's own heart. That's someone who's saying, search me. I'm, I have, I'm fine. I'm not in a problem right now, but I am welcoming God to search my heart. There's areas of my heart, believe it or not, for as long as I've been saved, that have not yet heard the gospel clearly. <laughs> There's undiscovered country on the inside of me that still needs Jesus. It's still ruled by that that uh, fleshly nature. It still rises up. I know I was a very willful person, but I had to die to being general manager of the universe. 
Now I only campaign occasionally. <laughs> and when I campaign, Jennifer shuts it down and says, she says, let's vote. And there's two of us, let's vote. Guess who wins? That's another thing about women. You want to vote? We'll vote. I vote no. The smart thing is to do, get in agreement. Really. Everything goes good when there's two red lights or two green lights. One red light, one green light in the same house, not good. Not good. Someone needs to press into God a little farther until that light changes from red to green or green to red. All right? Because God's not confused. He wants to give guidance. But basically God says, my spirit remains upon you. And I believe he even gave us a promise. Uh, my birthday is the 22nd. And I noticed in this one, it, it was something like the 29th but, or, or the 25th or something. I don't have it handy here. But it says, from that day forward, I will bless you. And I believe you're going to start seeing the change even now. The third aspect of an awakening, if it's genuine, is suddenly the blessing comes unexpectedly. Even if there were no seed in the barn, even if there was no crops, from this day forward, I'm blessing you. And we've seen that since the Lord spoke that. Now, I know it's the difference between the Jewish calendar and our current calendar, but I'm telling you, September is a time where God's shown forth that He's blessing. He basically told us twice now, watch what I'm going to do. Amen. And we're not trying to make anything happen. I'm watching. All right? right? That's the smarter thing to do. And I believe that God's basically going to say, this is a time and a season of blessing. Haggai 2, consider now from this day forward, oh, from the 24th day, two days after, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from that day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it, is the seed still in the barn and the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree has not yet yielded its fruit, but from this day forward, I'm going to bless you. Let's go through the three awakenings. Just like an eagle awakening over us. I believe that what we've got to do is get these things in us to where, Father, right now I choose, I yield to the gift of repentance. You can't even repent without the Holy Spirit. You know that? You can't, it's not a mental thing. I receive the gift of repentance. I want a new sensitive conscience. I want a life with a capital L to where it's a walk in the Spirit with a new awakening, my ear to hear, as the Spirit say. I repent and we repent as a corporate body to see what God is going to do because, Lord, awaken this temple to new life. And let me, let me, if we're going to pray for the awakening of the temple, let me give you something. We have a teacher we call Nine Wakings. I want to just read what it would look like. If you, were, if you were really awakened in these areas. First of all, you would notice it in your worship. You wouldn't need all the extraneous trappings of worship. You don't need the fire or the lights and the smoke. All of a sudden it's going to be, who is this coming out of the wilderness like smoke? It's going to be you. It's going to be the presence of God in you. You're going to be able to smoke without the fancy worship, without the songs, the dances, and the banners, the flags, all of which are fine. But in reality, you're the one that should be smoking in worship. Huh? A new sensitivity. I love that in the Song of Solomon. Who is this that's coming out of the wilderness like smoke? I, I mean, talk about smoking. Huh? <laughs> Shoo. That's the radiant of the bride. But it'll show up in your worship. And worship is meant to be a lifestyle. Worship is not songs. Worship was meant to be a lifestyle to where you honor God. The second one, your devotions. Are you aware of His presence when you worship, but are you aware in your private devotions? What are your private devotions like? Do you just read something? Mental people have a tendency to do their duty. They'll read their daily bread or whatever. And then feel like I can move on now. I did my duty. Oh my goodness. The minute you close your eyes, you want to touch him. Prayer is being with someone, not reading about them. Amen. And when you touch him spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath, you're in communion. It should be a divine romance of wills. It should be a, a, a holy experience of union and communion where you touch him, you hear him, you see him. 
The third element of awakening that human spirit making a sense of, be aware to his nature. In other words, you have the equipment in you, every one of you, that if you hear something spoken, you should be able to discern from your gut what nature is on those words. Have you ever had somebody go, oh, I just love that outfit. Right, ladies? And something in you felt like, I don't think they did. Yeah. That's actually discernment. It's not the content of the words, it's what's on the words. The nature. You've got to learn to be able to perceive, to be fully awakened and aware of the nature that's on the words. Just like we taught the kids. Before you go lay hands on somebody, drop down and open the door of your heart to Jesus, then lay hands. We're so fast at laying hands and saying whatever we want, calling it prophecy, blah, 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 and not paying any attention to what it's connected to. Could just be anxious, anxiety, and a need to do something. That's not anointed. Here's the other one. When your spirit is fully awake, your creativity flows. Right? How many of you are creative? Artists, musicians, what have you. If you're bummed out, you're going to have what they call writer's block, creative block, because you're here. And down here, it's turmoil. You get rid of the turmoil, and the creativity of your spirit rises up and inspires that. That's basically like prophecy. Prophecy should be you go down, drop down to your spirit, you open the door of your heart to Jesus, and then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks from a relaxed, peaceful place of his lordship. No striving, no sweating. You know, most people, when they do the prophetic, if, if they struggle with the prophetic, the struggle is here. They censor themselves while they're talking. Like, oh, what if that's the wrong word? That's like, you're also shooting yourself in the foot when you do that. You block the flow of creativity. How many talk themselves out of, be honest, how many talk themselves out, out of coming up here? It's easy. It's easy to do. That doesn't honor God. I want to see 25% at least come up with a word. Be prepared to go to church to participate instead of just receiving. I know we've been trained to be spectators. All right. The next area after creativity to transcend time. If you're fully awake in your spirit, all of a sudden you're in the presence of God and you're not aware of the clock like put, putting your duty in. Okay, I'm going to pray 20 minutes. I got 20 minutes before I go to work. Okay, I'm going to pray. There, I did my 20 minutes. That's kind of religious, isn't it? But when you get into the presence of God and you lose track of time, you brought, you brought yourself into a transcendent spiritual awareness where the Spirit was ruling over your mind, your will, and your emotions. Beautiful place to be. The next one is tracking. How many know how to track? Worship people should learn to do this. You kind of feel the flow of something. And you know, most of you ha have the same equipment and you've done this. Have you ever been in a meeting where one person goes, I just hear the Lord saying it's like a gold shield. I just hear the Lord saying there's a blanket covering me. I just hear another one say that uh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. I hear another one saying the good shepherd. Another one says, I think there's a spirit of homosexuality. Have you ever experienced that in a meeting? <laughs> to where all of a sudden there was a flow and then someone had their own idea and it kind of stands out like a sore thumb. You have the capacity to follow flow in your heart. You have the capacity to tell when the flow or the, is broken as well. When you're fully awake, you'll be able to track and follow and engage that's spiritual life. Jennifer and I like doing it in the mall. She likes to go to South Park Mall, and we just kind of flow and track, talk to who we feel led to talk to. I like that because it's beyond your rational thinking. It's something you just have to keep your heart open to. Clerks, what have you. We eat out so much. Waitresses are our mission field now. We have to go to lots of different restaurants, though, because we have to expand that mission field. <laughs> All right? When you're fully awake, 
The next area, besides tracking and being aware of time, is really communicating an inner yes. Have you ever heard something preached or taught or prophesied that you didn't quite absorb it mentally yet, but down here it felt good? Like, yes. There's an inner yes. There's also an inner no. There's times I've gotten an inner no when someone's talking about something that is verbally is harmless, but what was behind it wasn't. And, and to the contrary. A lot of times somebody say something, I don't know what they're saying, but all of a sudden, I got that yes with the children. I like the way they talk dropping down. Drop down and open the door to God. Open the door of your heart. It's not good to close the door to Jesus. I could feel an inner yes just with their verbiage, just with their choice of words to explain something spiritual. That's a, there's a good yes in there on it. And I'm going, I've never said it like that. I like that. And just like the third grader, there was a nice yes on that too when he said, well, everybody knows there's no living water in your head. Everybody knows the living water comes out of the belly, out of the heart, flows rivers. The next area, when you're fully awake relationally, there is a glory that's experienced in relationship. Primarily in the marriage relationship, there's a glory that can be experienced that transcends anything the world knows or understands. How much more is there going to be an experience with the glory of God for a corporate church to experience? Hmm? And the last area is when your spirit is fully awake your immune system benefits from an awakened healthy spirit because you're prospering and being in health as your soul prospers a fully awakened spirit your immune system and you walk in better health when your spirit is fully awake and alive your immune system operates at optimum Oh yeah, and then there's one more. Conscience. You have a good conscience, a clean conscience, but it's easily grieved when you do wrong. It's not like, like if you're in a habit of doing wrong, it's like a pillow goes on the conscience and you don't even feel it buzz anymore. But a sensitive conscience. The way God did it for me was when Jennifer and I first got married, I found out Jennifer had been, had been uh, emotionally abused a great deal um, by a previous husband and even her father, for that matter. And I said, Lord, if I ever hurt her feelings, make my conscience shout. And I'll tell you what, the first time, and I didn't do it on purpose, the first time I hurt her feelings, I felt like a donkey kicked me in the gut. And you know what I said? Good. I think the whole church ought to get a donkey kick in the gut when you do wrong. I mean, if you're that insensitive, and apparently that was a Holy Spirit-inspired prayer to even ask for that because I could have overlooked it. often wonder how much we overlook hurting other people's feelings, hmm? needing to be sensitive. But on the other hand, a fully awakened church, awakened spirit doesn't get easily hurt either. Peace guards their heart and their mind. And they can feel the offense, but they don't take it in. So, Father, we pray right now for those three aspects of repentance, to hover over this temple for intentional sanctification, because we're looking forward to the days ahead of a full awakening, a blessing that's going to pour out larger than anything that we would ever think or expect. But God said, from this day forward, I will bless you. I want to see that, what God is going to do. Twice he's told us, right, Jennifer? Watch what I'm going to do. I have no idea what that means yet. Got a lot of ideas, and it's usually none of the above when it comes to pass. But Father, we're going to do this right now. I receive the gift of repentance right now. I receive repentance for a slumbering spirit. I receive repentance for being asleep in areas that I didn't even know I was asleep in. Give me a rude awakening. 
I'm doing stuff in a dream state that if I was fully awakened, I would never do. I've been behaving in ways that if I was fully awake, I would, quit, would have quit doing a long time ago. I want to start paying attention to this temple. It's a holy temple. It's a habitation of God. I want you, Holy Spirit, to work on this temple. Stir up this like Zerubbabel and Joshua. Stir me up to desire to work on this temple, to welcome the Lordship of Jesus, to bring us into new depths of experience in Him. Awake, awake, you sleeper. Awake out of that slumber, out of that stupor. Even a religious spirit, the Lord's given me a word about a religious spirit. It's when you start to get sleepy in church, but you're not sleepy before and after. A religious spirit is like the opiate of the people. It would like to lull you not to hear what you need to hear. Awaken my ear to hear, like a mother eagle hovering. Hover over my potential for the capacity to hear the voice of God more clearly, for his sheep know his voice. Awaken my ear, morning by morning, awaken my ear to hear. Incite me to new action. Incite me to come alive. Excite me, incite me, Lord, to awaken that word. I wanna see the waking tree. I want to see that you're about to awaken and arouse and incite to action that word that you placed within our hearts. In some cases, even years ago, visions and dreams that are in there. I want to see that seed. I want the wind and the breath of the Spirit to blow upon that seed and awaken and bring it to life. It's except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and break open and that taproot goes down. It remains alone. But if it goes down, it rises up and is fruitful. Thank you, Lord. Bring that forth in my heart and in my life. Cause my conscience to be easily, easily grieved by anything that dishonors you. Ultimately, all sin is against God. And anything that I do in the way of sin dishonors my God. I receive forgiveness right now. And I open my heart to receive the harvest, to receive the harvest. From this day forward, I will bless you. Even if you don't see it right now, from this day forward, you're going to see it. Watch what I'm going to do in the days ahead. From this day forward, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to fill the barns. I'm going to cause an increase. For it's a time to receive the harvest for what you've sown. It's time to take seriously all that God has promised you and all that God has placed within your heart. It's time to receive the war reward through faith and patience. We inherit the promises. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today 
at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.